Welcome to the artist and welcome to those of you who are here to engage in this amazing artist panel that we're going to have this evening. My name is Heka Bintkati. I'm the curator here. I've been the curator for many, many years. And um, this particular show was basically my goal was to create a space for LGBTQ plus artists and to make this space a safe space and to make sure that we open space in a way that was celebratory, but also affirming. Um, and I hope supportive. So that's me. Um, if you're ever interested in how can I show in this gallery, it's just a matter of sending an email. We put you on the artist email list and then opportunities are sent out as they become available. Our next show is Across Imaginary Boundaries, and that is for artists of Caribbean descent. And that is just for those artists who identify with that, with that ethnic origin, ethnic descent, because we really want that show to be a kind of conversation about getting rid of boundaries boundaries that have been set in place by colonialists and um, have a long history, but what can artists do to begin to dismantle and disrupt those boundaries? Um, so, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name is Ali Wadud. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my name is Alia Madud. I'm the associate curator here in the gallery. Um, and welcome to our artist panel. Um, so this panel is called Transcending Boundaries. Um, oh, now you can hear me, right? Uh, so today we have 10 artists who are part of the lovely show, Love is the Only Norm, um, joining us here. And I thought we could start um, with going down the row and just saying our names and pronouns. Uh, and we have some questions. Um, maybe we could start with names and pronouns and then I'll say the, the questions after for, for each of you. Okay. Uh, that's me. Uh, uh, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, and, uh, hi. Uh, Elizabeth Tita Feud and uh, she, her. You know who I am, but I have to say one thing. I am she, her, but I actually think that those are constructs, and I'd like to live in a world where we don't have to identify under any kind of binary classification. So that's my disclaimer. <laughs> Anthony Amuar, he, him, and sometimes she. <laughs> Seth Ruggles Tyler, he him. Ricardo Osmondo Francis, I'm a dude. I'm Christoph Sawyer, and I go by he, they. Um, so just to introduce ourselves as artists, um, I was thinking that we could go down the line again um, and answer these three questions. What city are you currently based in? Um, what are your mediums of choice? And in one to two sentences, can you describe uh, your art practice? Um, so what do you make and how do you make it? Um, so, what was the first part of that question? What city are you currently based in? What kind of work am I currently making? Uh, what city are you so currently the, based in? Um, I, uh, work representationally, I make figurative work. Uh, I work in media, two-dimensional media, but currently I'm doing a, a lot of oil painting and a lot of uh, smaller studies of acrylic gouache. I am a bomb space artist, um, and my 
focus is primarily photography, painting, um, as well as uh, mixed media, resin, um, and wood resin, or say wood burning. Um, I live in Rockwalker. Uh, I'm I guess I'm, I'm a photographer and a collage artist. Um, what I've been really into lately is alternative printing, so I've been doing like anthotypes. Um, I just did one of the strawberry juice that turned out to be great, even though it's raining the whole time. <laughs> um, and the goal of that is really just to encourage people to get their images off their devices and actually like, I don't know, work with them, interact with them, look at them. and scratch it that time. I don't know the correct name. My English is a little crazy. Um, so I also do charcoal. So I try to try many, many, many kinds of styles and I check many kinds of media to check how that works. And use, um, my main of my technique I use to do my art is surrealist. And I like to be free for creators something, and if people can look that kind of art and try to pick a little piece what what about something if I want to say, and yeah, that is basically is all I do. Well, I'm based in Brooklyn. Um, I'm an illustrator, so I am into representational illust um, figurative pieces. I mostly use pencil, marker, um, watercolor, and I would say that my practice. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my practice, I would, you know, I'm a self-taught artist, and art for me really is just kind of a reflective practice of kind of almost like therapy and so um, I create in a therapeutic way to just understand and uncouple kind of dense emotional feelings. Uh, I work mainly in oil paint, uh, some acrylic and some different drawing mediums. Uh, I focus on nature and landscape, portraiture <clears throat> and the figure. Um, we'll talk about it later, but sometimes I interpret older photography and film, um, but a lot is from observation of nature and then finished with studio paint and also one-on-one -on -one portraiture lab. Act based. Based, well, I'm based in Newark, New Jersey, but I live in Washington Heights now, so I'm kind of across the Hudson all the time. Um, my practice is acrylic and mixed media collage, and uh, a friend of mine recently called my work Afro Surrealism, so I'm, I'm gonna go with that. Wow. Uh, I'm, Can you hear me now? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm based in Purchase, New York, next to uh, White Plains. I'm a trained new media artist. Um, my work deals with queer issues, queer identities, um, and uh, one of the mediums that I've been working in a lot is 
one of one of yeah. Um, one of the mediums that I've been working in a lot is acrylic, and I've been laser etching the acrylic. Um, so if that's kind of hard to imagine, the three piece, circular pieces behind you, those are my pieces. It's very hard to kind of explain without looking at it. Um, but lately, I've been working with an archive of a artist from Yonkers, and so I've been thinking a lot more about queer archives, uh, archival history, um, and how do we relate to the past? So these next set of questions, the way it's going to go, everyone, is we're going to ask the question. Not all of you will answer it. We'll choose from whoever wants to answer it. Hopefully somebody will. Um, so that's the way it'll go, and I'll we'll choose from over here, and then Alia will choose from over there, and we'll just kind of go with the flow, see how our time goes, and where the conversation goes. Okay, so how can art engage transgender, gender fluid, and non-binary identities in meaningful and important ways? How does your work do that? <laughs> How can art engage transgender, gender fluid, and non-binary identities in meaningful and important ways, and how does your work do that? I certainly found so many examples of that when I was choosing works, and so there are works in this show that definitely speaks to that. Um, and even if your work doesn't speak to that, you can still answer that question.
just the representation is little and important. You're ready for a lot of those kids. <laughs> <laughs> is my friend, like art is someone that doesn't judge me, it's like kind of like the idea of God, say it like that, but more like in a concrete way, so yeah, um, I, I did the Taino piece, so if people don't know what is a Taino, who is a Taino, Taino people are the indigenous people from the Caribbean, and like most people don't know them, because they say they they have been extinct, like they don't exist. And what I'm trying to do with this piece is like to say, yeah, they existed, they exist, and also to say they also were queer. Like queer is not a byproduct of today's world. They were also queer. Like that was just their culture. That was their everyday life. And they did art. They did everything. And so that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. I think one thing artists are very good at is not seeing the outside of people to be their, their spirit. And I think that if, uh, not if, we, we want to represent everybody. And I think shows like this are important to show that there's not just two sets of humanity, but there's a variation on a the theme, basically. So um, I'll, I always believe, and I know that or just from our mental deal, that um, if you tell the truth, that's all that's really needed in your work. Um, and telling the truth uh, helps to inform everyone else what something they're thinking about or struggling with or is important to them and they see it in a visual reference and then it becomes more of like um, they take from that and then that helps them to continue with their thing. So that's how I see, in terms of your question, that's how I, I can answer it. Um, I have a poem that I wanted to read as a response to that question. Art is feeling, art is creative, art is accepting and loving, art allows. Art allows us to imagine other versions of ourselves. Art allows us to see things we don't normally get exposed to. Art allows us to see the us we don't get to see in the world. The us we hide from the world. Art is. Um, I just wanna, uh, respond to what you were just saying about the ways that people can relate to the imagery. And I think um, this space is a really important space, being in a library, being in a place of knowledge, of a place where people can find knowledge, a place that's free. Um, and this library in particular is really important to the community here. And for people to be able to just walk in here and see the work, um, it either gets them exposed to queerness if they're not queer or that's not part of their world. Um, I often think about queer youth and them coming in here and maybe it's a child, a young person just seeing the work and seeing something and connecting to it. And also the other audience is us, the people making the work and how we connect and um, you know what we're saying about ourselves in the work. So I think there's a lot of different audiences that can react to the work. Um, and, um, you know, with my own work, uh, 
I, for a long time, I've been making work around my queerness um, and around kind of social practice. And so even in high school, I made a documentary about people's coming out stories and I screened it locally um, in Westchester. Um, so I think that art is a really powerful medium to, for all those kind of different audiences and different reasons. Um, and I also just want to say that, um, you know, I'm working on this archive of this photographer from Yonkers, and I'm thinking about um, his queerness um, through time. He uh, had a lot of internalized homophobia, I'm finding, through my research. And so, you know, I want to say he's a gay artist, he's a gay photographer. And so that's kind of a challenging um, thing to do when the person has passed and is no longer around. Um, and I also just want to speak to archives and, um, you know, queerness has looked really different in the past. You know, we can have these conversations now about gender fluidity, but um, with so much hatred and homophobia in the past and even today, um, you know, it's hard for people to have those labels and identities. So um, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation today and that we're allowed to be here and knock on wood, there's no protesters. Um, you know, this library has done a lot of uh, drag queen story hour and I've seen a lot of positive protesting outside to make sure that um, no hate gets in here. And, you know, again, I just think that the library and this space in particular is really special to the community. I uh, just wanted to follow up because Christoph and uh, my work has a very similar theme. Um, I've been researching the photography and uh, film of my great uncle, who I didn't know, but was also also gay and an artist. He wasn't a professional artist like uh, uh, George. Um, but um, I didn't know him at all, but I was given his photo prints and his eight millimeter uh, films um, to do whatever I wanted with them. And I really found, and we have the, the video um, on loop in the back, yeah. So we were talking about spaces <clears throat> and spaces where we can express ourselves and our gender identity. And th these are videos from the, the 40s, I believe. And um, there's gender bending, and there's men dressing as women, and women dressing as men. This series of this bather, it was a, a man in a woman's bathing suit. Yes, yes, and he, it was like big kids. Yeah, and, he's, and he uh, slowly unwraps his, his uh, head wrap and takes off the bathing suit. Um, so, and I think about how that was pride at a beach, there's like a party there out inside, and they felt so much freedom to express their gender back then, but I can only imagine how they would feel uh, if it was a, a public thing. So I try to capture that. Um, that joy and also the vulnerability there. I see I see some vulnerability with the I see it. With the uh, favor. Good piece. Good piece. Thank you. Well thank you so much. Um, often we see non-binary being represented represented in the media as white and drowny. Um, so how can art question that representation and even bring to light other depictions that redefine what it means? Could you ask that again? We're having yeah. trouble with that microphone. Right now. I do not hear. Oh, maybe this. I'd like to hear Can that you question. Hear? <laughs> um, often we see non-binary being represented in the media as white androgyny. Um, so how can art question that representation and even bring to light other depictions that redefine what it means to be non-binary? Kind of 
creating the history that we were never uh, granted for one reason or another. Um, I think uh, one artist in particular that I'm thinking of, um, Ellie Maynard, um, does a really great job of recreating from one group and then everyone else has to figure out where their place is in the equation. So that's kind of a, a double-edged sword, unfortunately.
trying to comprehend and trying to visualize someone that existed that I never met, like someone that I could aspire to be, someone that I could admire, um, as someone from Dino Ancestry, and just like, I feel like all my representation is like from my Spaniard side, and like not even my African side, like it's only the Spaniard, that's like the only form, like they were saying before, like about the white um, white non-binary non thing, because it's always uh, what gets more the attention. And right now, in this time of the world, is what happened around colonization and all that stuff. Um, but I feel like before all that happened, I tried to imagine that, and I tried to imagine and I tried to comprehend that it was accepted and that it was a normal thing that people used to be loving and kind. Yeah, there were fights and all that stuff, but I feel like um, queer people back then were healers and artists and they got to express themselves and they got to be who they truly are. Because like if you know, you know, you know that queer people are actually magic, if you know. Yeah. But some people don't see it. like. I feel like my identity is not something physical, it's more than this, that some people don't truly really see it. Because people think they can only see the, this image, but that's not completely me. And that's what I'm trying to do with that sculpture. Like, it wasn't just an indigenous person, it was also a person, it was also a soul, trying to do something in this world, trying to change, but their stories have been buried and I'm trying to search them in this big sea and trying to feel them and trying to be like them and trying to comprehend and merge it all together and you know continue the cycle of this world. Thank you. to be queer, um, gender queer, um, and I think that points to the absolute genocide that you know, indigenous people have experienced, um, and also the lack of preservation of queerness um, in communities that aren't necessarily white communities or communities here in the States. Um, and it's so interesting that then it kind of leaves it up to you in your imagination and your own feeling, your own, this intangible queerness that you're talking about that exists within you. Um, and it's so intangible in also your connection to your roots. Um, so it's like you're tapping into this invisible side of you that you know exists, um, but you're not really sure where, and you're not really sure what the words are. Um, it's a really beautiful journey. Um, and also kind of a sad journey. Um, I, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, as we've gone through colonialism, you know, that the colonialists, um, the way that they dealt with indigenous people was to simplify them and to not tell the whole story, but to tell, um, for me as an Arab, to tell the oriental story and, and to only tell the pieces that fit into the way that they wanted to represent Arabs. And I think all indigenous people have experienced that through the oppression and colonization um, that has happened in their communities. So that the whole story was never, you know, if, if things are being simplified and we're just looking at tokens, then, then a whole part about archiving because I think that that's it, right? It's
I mean, there has to be people that uh, record history, human history, real human history, because oftentimes the written word is usually a, a marketing scheme of some sort. You know, I mean, I'm a Generation Xer, and so marketing was something in the '80s, especially when I was as I was growing up. It was like, this is you know a car, this is uh, McDonald's, or this is this or this is that, or this is Coca-Cola. These were the things that made me American. But there are other things that are very American that uh, you're not gonna see on television. You'll see it right in front of the uh, people that are either pointing fingers at you or dealing with the police or this and other, a variety of things. So for me as an artist, to be able to tell everything and sometimes all at once is a beautiful thing. It's a necessary thing and I think artists we have a sixth sense of being able to do that, and that's why we irritate a lot of people. <laughs> you know, because we we tell a real, true human story of identity, human identity. So, in terms of answering your question about how do I go about uh, representing queerness, I think of it as humanity first, and the other aspects of it just sort of come. Um, if I did it like, oh, I'm a gay artist, I, I feel like that would be belaboring the point a bit for me. I mean, some uh, artists start with that and that actually works for them. And for me, it's like, I'm gonna tell a human story. Uh, a story that even a quote unquote non-gay person or a person who is either male or just female or whatnot, they can look at it and they're like, you know what, I think I'm getting something out of this that I can connect to. It may not be my story, may not be what I am, but I can relate in some manner. And so I, I think of it sort of how a novelist thinks of their characters when they write, you know, um, I think of my portraits in the same, same way. It's just characters that need to tell their story privately first. And then they just, you know, you see them, um, get to share it with the viewers. I just would want to amend one thing that you were, uh, to what you were saying, you're talking about the need to record, mm -hmm. but what you're also talking about, the act of what you're doing, sounds like it's interpretation. And I, I think that that's an important thing that artists do, is they not only record, but they kind of make decisions about what it is they're recording. And to themselves, find at least a handful of books um, where they could see themselves and feel represented. Um, and you can imagine these days, it's like more and more challenging. Like when I was finishing teaching a few years ago, there were parent committees reviewing our books before we showed them to our kids, and that was around here. There wasn't that many. But anyway, um, but you know, as an artist, it's this, it's, I get to take a more hands-on approach and, and, and have a role in creating pieces of art that people can, it's just sort of like, a, up, like the other end of the spectrum, instead of having to dig around and find, you know, works that my kids could, um, you know, see themselves in, I get to, I get to take an active role in doing that, and it's, I don't want to say it's like more important, but it's just definitely, it's just different, but it's, um, it's, yeah, it's really important, and it's just, it's, I don't know, just it feels different. Talk about the idea of queerness being an umbrella term as opposed to set and separate boxes that one must identify with. I think the term is a little misleading personally. Amen. 
So, I'm sorry. So, when I was really young and I first heard the, what the term queer meant, right. it meant an individual that was really flamboyant and that would be picked on by everybody. And you knew that they were gay, this, that, and the other. It was all a bunch of negatives. And for me, already in my young mind, I was like, well, as a we're not all the same type of individual, so if a person's going going into what not, is that, is that really a big issue with you? But, you know, I, I grew up in a very conservative uh, city at the time, so, you know, to just take it as is. But it's interesting to go from coming out as a gay man and then all of a sudden I'm just queer or I'm part of, I'm just part of a network of people, I think it's not a horrible thing, but at the same time, it's, if we're all about identity here, then, you know, are we all really queer? It, it all, it's almost like, it's a circular term that doesn't have any real direction in my opinion. So that's what I mean by, I, I, it's a little misleading, I think. Um, I think it's very interesting. I actually uh, have been out since I was 14, and I had a lot of feelings about the term queer growing up. I always felt like, why are you calling yourself queer? Just call yourself what you are. And that's what I felt about me. And then over time, I realized that that is not, you know, I, I do identify as queer now, and it really is like um, one of my partners calls it. Uh, you identify you're queer if you're like, you know, like you're just fluid, you're open. Um, it's not necessarily like putting yourself into a box, like in the question, in the, in the question. And I think that actually opens up a lot of, you know, aspects of sexuality and identity, not just calling, putting yourself in a box, um, because everything is very fluid. And, um, I think I have found a lot of comfort in identifying as lesbian um, before, but as I've grown, I just see that there's a lot more meanness in, in queerness, in questioning all aspects of myself and how I relate and how I love and how I just interact with other humans. I like that answer, actually. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Does your art express your narrative? Do you think it is important for your art to always do that? Um, so <clears throat> I'm a first generation Nigerian American gay man, so I identify as being gay. Um, and for me, art has been important because, you know, in the cultural context that I grew up in, being gay was not a thing. <laughs> you're not gay in a, um, in the context that I grew up in, like in a Nigerian household. And so it was really important for me to explore my queerness, my gayness, and I was able to do that through my art and kind of look at themes that I repressed um, during my childhood. So really kind of looking at just being black. So the, the piece that I have in the show um, is a self-portrait of myself, like, you know, using black marker and like simple lines and, you know, pinky hair. And those were things that, you know, I had a hard time accepting in myself. And so art was a powerful tool for me to really explore, you know, my sexuality, but also my blackness. And I think, um, you know, lots of people deal with that as well. And so it's important to, to create so that you help other people um, ex, you know, explore those, those dimensions of who they are. Okay. Is that it? Uh, no, one else? no, I mean, 
All of us can really answer it. Yeah. 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 Question is, how does your art express your narrative? Do you think it's important for your art to always do that? taking up space. Um, one of the images I have is just a little space profile, um, kind of like in your face, and there's nowhere else that you can look. I think that's really important. Um, and then my other piece is very loud, which I can do. Um, and very <coughs> proud about being loud. There have been, I guess, a lot of people who came before me that didn't have the opportunity to, so I think it's very important that um, my art does that in a certain way. But in the same token, I also very much understand um, that you know my art doesn't necessarily have to tell that story. Sometimes I can create just because I woke up to it, um, or because it's raining outside. I feel like it, um, so I think that's really important too. So we can just take this and do. Um, I guess I would say I don't really see my artwork as expressing my narrative, and that it's not really telling the same story. I mean, I can be very literal about these things, but, um, but it uses the idiom of Western culture. I draw a lot on Western European painting, which is, you know, I, is, is where I come from. Um, and, you know, and, and I hope that it uses it to uh, kind of be more self-aware about that tradition. That's the best thing I can say about it. I think it's really interesting um, that you're talking about the food you're getting from people. Um, so that is something connected to you in a lot of different ways, but is it necessarily your narrative? Um, and so not to put you on the spotlight if you don't want to answer, but I think I'm, I'm interested in seeing how you could answer this question. Um, I have been saying it's uh, an exploration of my queer ancestry. Um, an exploration of my queer ancestry. Um, and there's only so much <clears throat> information I can get from the visuals that were left behind by my great uncle. So I think that in responding to and kind of re reconstructing the scenarios, I think I bring myself into that, in my imagination of what they are. Um, there is, there's this piece here, another theme that um, he explored was he took photographs um, of fishermen on boats, and there were always shadows cast from from the docks onto the onto the um, decks of the boats. And when you printed the photographs um, of specifically the boats, they were just like tiny little text ones, and all the other ones were bigger, and those were like landscapes and still lives and urban landscapes. Um, so I was like, I'm. He was, he was held back from printing them big and like speaking loudly about them. So I, I've used those motifs to overlap with some of my own own um, figurative in imagery underneath, where I, I did a lot of series where I took images from um, like the, the dating apps, as they call them. So that was bringing some of my own experience and combining it with his. Um, so I think that was
Oh, in the bird. For me, art is an addiction, so that and it's a good addiction. You know, I think some addictions are good, like reading is a good addiction. Not wanting to learn things is a good addiction. Um, and for me, I I don't like personally the like it's fine art. Like that to me is not my approach to it. I think of my work as sketchbooks, as, as pages from a sketchbook. So uh, mixing things is a constant in what I do. Um, so my work is spread out. The uh, diptych that's of the young Latino man, um, it's Carlos in the New World, that's one piece. Uh, Anthony in a red choir robe is the other one on this side. And there's another one that's on this, on one of the walls here, which is called To See. And there's something about painting and drawing for me where my mind is not connected to anything that's on this planet, it's somewhere else. Um, and I think that if you hear, especially like whether a writer or a composer or a dancer, if they speak of where they got ideas, sometimes they'll tell you like a very weird answer like, oh yeah, I, I just heard a, a, a bird chirping and I, I heard a melody of one aria or something like that, things like that. Uh, I mean, I think art comes from nature. You know, it's a, uh, I think it's God's communication through human beings to, or other human beings in, in which he's speaking through us or they are speaking through us <laughs> to send messages to humanity in which to learn. Um, so I think of art making in many ways as a, way of passing messages along to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, so this is kind of more of a, a general question. Uh, but why is it important to expose the intersections within queer communities and within your art? So uh, not just talking about LGBTQ plus issues, but also race and class issues that may intersect with those um, race issues. other things uh, intersect. That's where they connect, right? Uh, where they connect with like, queerness and all that, because how can you know who you truly are if you don't know these other parts of yourself? And uh, how can you know that you're queer, but like, if you don't dig deep enough to find other parts of yourself, like aspects that affect your everyday life, just like race and class and all of these other things, they all affect us and also influence our queerness, our way to express ourselves, our emotions. So it's important to talk about these things that sometimes get left behind, get, get lost or get um, buried. So we need to dig for them and find them to truly find who we are and what it means to be queer or LGBTQ, people don't relate to the word um, queer, um, LGBTQ plus. So yeah, thank you. <clears throat> you know, we're no single story, we're complex people. Complex, you know, uh, just because you're queer doesn't mean that you can only relate to a certain thing. Can be gay, lesbian, black, Hispanic, rich. You know, you live in a certain location. There's so many. There's such complexity uh, around the human experience, and so it's really important to try to understand all those areas that make us who we are. Um, and art has the power to, you know, glimpse that. Um, Tension Sarkanali really is a very important 
um, piece of our of our of everyone's story, um, and to know that and to highlight that in in you know in art is I think in its truest form showing showing for me at least showing like my full self my full my full being and like you know I'm not just a one size fits all type of person you know like my art is very much you know. I think shows that I am an Asian woman who is a child of immigrants, who um, is queer, and who, for a lot of my life, had to be silenced or felt like I needed to be silenced about my feelings, my emotions, um, because I'm supposed to be stoic. I'm supposed to be in control and disciplined. And, um, you know, being honest about me and open about the intersectionality about my life, you know, really helps others who feel the same way to emote that way, to be as open. So, yeah. And hearing that is powerful because, you know, I'm a, a son of immigrant parents too. And so, you know, these stories, there are connections there. Mm -hmm. And there are connections with how you grew up and you know, being stoic and suppressing that I experienced too. And so, you know, in sharing that in art and speech and literature, we're building bridges of understanding and that's really powerful. Yeah, it's so beautiful that not just the topics intersect with one another, but then so do your stories. Um, and I think that's the same with, for audiences when they're, when they're looking at your work, um, is that even if they're not exactly of your exact demographic, there's certain things that they can connect yeah. with. Um, or that really resonate with them. Um, you know, you can have a straight person who's also Asian and be like, oh, I really had that experience, you know? Um, so that's really important, it's really beautiful. And then there's people who are exactly of your demographic who have not experienced any kind of representation of being queer and Asian. Um, and you can finally see that. And it's really lovely. But one thing that I did want to say, just in terms of narrative, there's a really great quote by Hans Ulrich, who is considered a great curator. And one thing he said is that the job of a curator is to not find art that looks good together on a wall, but to have an idea and then to seek out artists to help them expound upon that idea and make discoveries and explore places that the curator hadn't even thought that they wanted to go to. And I really, I think about that every time I put together a show and I definitely thought about it with this show. And I feel like there's such an amazing and wonderful collection of artists together that even in this talk, I knew we would have this great talk even if no one came and it was just us going back and forth, but you know, I I truly have been fulfilled by just hearing everyone's perspective and thank you for that. I, I think you have how does it feel to share an art space with other LGBTQ plus artists? <laughs> How does that feel different than in other art spaces? intersectional uh, nuance, you know, there's there's things you're familiar with that you see them in a different way. Um, and that, you know, that's just really enriching. Um, 
I, I think that being in any perspective, it always you know, is stimulating, but, but I think this is not particularly stimulating. Yeah. I think it's amazing when we start to when we start to know these and what we concluded because we really don't start to make something for one direction. Like we make this for one kind of situation or one kind of exhibition. Uh, I feel so excited when I finish my piece and I start to look for opportunities and I just see one opportunity that just my art really talk about that. And that will be amazing if I can share my expression at the exhibition. So I think not in special for LGBT, but in general. Um, I think all exhibitions if I participated, all of that was amazing. And all of that was really good to see other artists if they made um, art with that topic and we can talk a little bit or we can share experience. So this in particular, I have this opportunity for uh, make something, not exact about me, but I can talk for my friends in Brazil. And we have uh, one year or more, always talk about this kind of topic about um, gay, um, homosexual, um, non-binary, no binary, uh, all of kinds, heterosexual, uh, pansexual, and we always bring this topic to talk a little bit and try to understand a little more. And all of them was exciting when I saw I was accepting one opportunity about LGBT and it was so exciting because um, we, in some parts we created that piece together, my piece trans, trans G, we make we, that was part about our conversation in a long time and everybody was excited to know about the exhibition and I show for everybody all pieces all artists um, for them and I think I think is this um, my feeling about all exhibitions if you're participating to see different expressions with the same topic or with that idea and we can share for other person to visit that gallery or that space, right? So, yeah. um, so I worked in corporate America for a very long time. And often I would be the only black person in a room full of black people. <laughs> and in those spaces, you feel you have to prove. I felt that I needed to prove my value, my worth. I needed to prove why I was in that space because you know, I'm with all these white people. Like, why are you here? Um, but I recently transitioned into a government role, and it's diverse. You know, there, you know, queer people, people of other colors. You, you know, it, it feels very supportive to be in spaces that are diverse, that are inclusive, and it's even more so, you said kinship, when you're in a space with other people that understand your experience, you don't have to explain, you know, the issues of coming out and, you know, rejection and, um, you know, all the things that come with being queer, like, it's powerful. And so, when you're in spaces with diverse people, but especially queer diverse people, um, it's powerful. And so, I mean, that's how I feel very thankful that Seth um, shared this information with me about this exhibit, but it feels, um, it feels warm, it feels powerful, there's a sense of kinship, and um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs>
it took me years to be comfortable always being in gay exhibits. Um, not that I was in the closet or anything. I think the issue was in terms of artistic commerciality. There is this, un, uh, this uh, there's this issue of, well, if you only show in these in these types of shows, this that you will only be known as that, and you won't be able to sell. And the reality is, is that for the longest time, everyone that saw the work saw something that was queer about it, and they I could they identified with it, and it helped them with certain aspects for themselves. And they would tell me things like, uh, "I've been thinking about this piece in terms of." The, whatever was happening in their life or whatnot. And after a while, I began to realize, it's like, you know what? Maybe this is the universe telling me that uh, it's important that I continue all to always tell this story. So to be in spaces or in uh, opportunities where I get to s tell the same story with other artists that are also telling their stories as well, it is powerful and necessary and, um, one thing that um, I think, especially for young people, they will always remember the first painting or sculpture or photograph that they saw. They will not remember the first TV show or movie that they saw. So I believe art has the ability to really, uh, especially for young minds, if they see something and there's something in their spirit that identifies with that, they remember that and that, that could help them at the most unlikely times when, when it's needed, so. Just. I just, I wanna add to that. Um, you know, again, I think it's so important that this is not just a regular gallery. This is a, this is a public space. Um, so many people just go to the library and I see them just kind of walk in and just discover this room full of amazing work. Um, if I had to have one word to describe it, I'd say it's colorful. I mean, that's what's beautiful about this queer show. There's just so many beautiful, bright colors in here. But um, again, I mean, whether it's someone that might be a little bit homophobic that might come in here and they may change their mind, they may have a better understanding. It may be a young kid, young person who sees something and they connect with it. Uh, whether it's art, whether it's being a queer person. Um, so I just feel really grateful to be in this kind of part of the community. And in Yonkers especially, uh, you know, I've been going to the Pride for a number of years and I've just seen it grow and grow and grow. And so just to see the library show their support for the community and, you know, this is a difficult time for queer people. Um, it's just unwavering support, and it's really beautiful. So we have one more question, and then we're gonna open up to the audience um, for questions. Um, but I wanna preface, preface this next question with just saying that we, we are in a library, and if you know the history of libraries in the United States, libraries have always been kind of the rampart of providing information, not taking an opinion, not, um, you call it any, um, any screening information. Um, yes, not censoring, but just making sure all information is provided, even perspectives that you may not agree with, it's about presenting all perspectives. And um, what I found in this show and every year when I do this show is that many people come into the gallery to protest, to make sure that their opinion against having a show with these themes is heard. And what I always say to them is, well, you have that perspective, but you're standing in a room where your perspective is not shared, but you still get the opportunity to hear it and see it and be exposed to it. And that's a powerful thing. That's an amazing thing that you can 
have all information at your disposal. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that about it. Now this particular library is so incredibly supportive towards that goal. So unbelievably supportive of me as a curator and in providing all information. There's a small collection of books outside of the gallery that you'll see, but it's just a tiny representation of what we have in our collection and it grows day by day. So this next question is, how do we as a community continue to open spaces for queer artists, specifically BIPOC queer artists, non-binary, gender fluid, and transgender artists? How do we do that? Willingly working together without the competition and the equation. I really think that that is the first step I really believe that's the first step is take the competition part out of the way and just willingly work together on things. Um, and even if it's a small pop-up show somewhere at a bar, you'll be surprised who's there and that turns into and blocks into, into something bigger and better and more lucrative, you know. Some of the greatest things started with small ideas that mm -hmm. ended up becoming very popular. So, I believe that ideas are just sort of, it's all for us to pick and select. Artists get to choose first, typically. <laughs> and we get to see it, I think, a, a bit more clearly than others. Um, and we, we work in a profession where possibility is always present. So, you know, um, I just think, you know, we band together and we, we make things happen, and that's the first step. I would like to jump in on that. I definitely feel like it's all about like the encouragement in the community, also just creating access in all capacities of art, whether that be creating art, whether it be viewing art, whether it be showcasing art. Um, I know I wouldn't be here unless it wasn't for my partner, Andrea. And she showed me like that this was an opportunity that you know that I could I could be here, and like I'm always going to think of other opportunities for other people and uplifting other people, and I think that's really that's really the way that's really what we got to do, right? Yeah, I just want to add to that like uh, we just need to find other groups and connect with other people that are outside of our circle. So find other. Uh, local LGBT queer groups, whether it's like a paddle club or um, a game night or something at a bar, just I think that's the way to create solidarity and to um, get more people involved in different uh, events and uh, a gallery like this. I, I want this to double down what you're saying to triple down. Um, no, I, I think connecting uh, with other groups and organizations, um, connecting artists to resources. So it's really hard to be an artist um, full time. And so really helping artists understand web development, uh, in marketing, there's financial resources that they need, kind of connecting them to those. I think um, even the city of Yonkers, I'm sure there are resources that they offer. I know the city of New York has resources for um, any type of business, art, you know, art making as a business also. And so just kind of making sure that there are spaces available for artists, but there are also connections to resources so that they can start, grow, and expand, and do great things. I agree to all of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's surprising how many people, I, this is a whole bigger issue, but how many people like, won't share an open call? Like they like are gatekeeping and holding it to themselves like it's a secret. I mean, you know, to that is just, I'm more of that. Um, and then also like, that, like, like grants, there are so many grants out there and I think people just are, simply aren't aware of them. 
Um, and the last thing I would say is, you know, you can apply to open calls and send your work around, but you also don't have to wait around for an opportunity. You can create an opportunity. I mean, we all know so many artists, so sometimes you're just talking to somebody that you know in some completely other way, in a completely different context, you find out that they're an artist. Um, that's how the yesterday worked. Um, <laughs> um, and so, in cre and like banding together and creating your own opportunities. You know, I mean, there are a lot of um, free or very affordable spaces that you can rent, whether it's like you know at a bar or like a local shop in your neighborhood. But there are other there are, there are libraries that have space that you can you know rent for a period of hours or something like that. So these are open opportunities if you can you want to. And just to expand on that last point is that the Arts Westchester actually has a um, an application process where you could apply to curate exhibits in their space. So, you know, get your group of artists together. There you site should look like and we did a whole series and spent a great deal of money on professionals to come and teach those workshops to artists but what I've discovered is that sometimes artists in our own community have that information and so our next series and and the other thing is that they were so popular so successful that now all of the grant money that I raise um, is going to be geared towards just doing artist development, nothing else, just artist development, because I realized how great the need is um, just by the artists that came and the artists that were on the waiting list. Um, so this next year, we'll just be doing more of all of that, maybe in a more intense way, like a whole three hours on the artist statement, that type of thing. It was a boot camp series that we did. But we're also looking for artists that are specialists. Like I have an artist that that literally knows everything about Instagram. That can teach you in five minutes how to put up a reel on Instagram. So we're going to be doing that workshop and many more. And I think they're very important. And then I just want to say to your comment, I my dream is being an East Village artist back in the. 60s and 70s, along with Agnes Martin, because that was a community that all supported each other. And it's just amazing when you read their stories and you hear their names, every single one of them became very famous. Artwork sells for millions of dollars. And they all were artists who said, oh, so-and-so who can't pay rent this month, let's put our money together. Let's find some place to do a show together. Let's, let's share art materials. Um, and that's how it worked. And we've really gotten away from that because we've fallen into the capitalist model of scar scarcity. And so we're all just holding on to stuff because you know I, I need this and if I share it, then somebody else will get it and I won't have it. And that really, it's not the way the universe works, first of all. And second of all, it, you never lose by giving. You never, ever will lose by giving. You will only increase. And so I just hope that as artists, we can get back to that, that we can get back to those days where we trust each other and we're willing to share. I knew that even if I share a resource and I don't get it and you do, that's all right. You've got my back. It'll come back around. We don't have to worry about that. So um, I think you wanted to say something. So Ali is going to say something, and then we're going to open to the audience as well. Um, I think just there's one word that has been ever present in the conversation, but hasn't necessarily been mentioned itself, uh, which is solidarity. Um, I think it's you know it's so important to understand that like this is practice. Um, and that solidarity looks like all of this, of sharing resources, of you know just helping one another out. Um, and it's interesting that we're in this group because, yes, 
it is specifically like an LGBTQ plus show, but it is clearly a very diverse space within that realm of LGBTQ plus. Um, and so um, in, in that solidarity, it, solidarity is practiced in understanding our diversity and the needs that need to be met by different kinds of people. Um, and understanding that like this, like capitalism, um, the gentrification that's in Yonkers are common um, enemies. Um, these are things that all of us are experiencing. You know, specifically within Yonkers, we see this because it's, because it's huge. Um, and that no matter what background you come from, no matter what walk of life you come from, um, that's something that everyone is dealing with. Um, and so this practice of solidarity, of sharing resources, of putting one another on, like letting people know what's going on within your community, within other communities, within the art world, and not, all, and not just the art world, within your living situations, things about rent, all of these things, you know, are a practice of solidarity. And just this, this one space is, is an example of that. Um, so yeah, so maybe we can open up. Yeah, I'll bring the mic to you. Good evening, my name is Iris, and I'm a member of the community. And I've lived here for six years, and this is the first time I've been up close to a beautiful exhibition of artwork. Um, everyone's from a different community, place, background. But if we weren't here specifically for this show, would we know that it was LGBTQ community and see it. The work is phenomenal. If any one of you on the panel would have walked into this room, would you have known immediately that it was this specific designated artwork or exhibition? Or would it just be art to you? Beautiful pieces. The 60s, the 50s and 40s <laughs> of the film that you found is awesome. And there's a, a band member artist right here in Yonkers, Matthew Piazzi, and he is 40s, 50s, bam, that would be excellent background. As a matter of fact, this is his mom, who happens to be a famous <laughs> voice coach, as a matter of fact, and this is Judith, a new member to the community. But art, whether it's drawing or art and music, music and art goes together like salt and pepper. So, you know, um, each one of you come from such a different diversity. And we happened to be invited. My husband was walking on the riverfront taking pictures and saw the young right here and invited. Miss Christine invited us. Yes. And so thank you for the invitation. So we all are the same. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, from X, Y, or Z. What is your skin color? We all are immigrants from somewhere at some time. And so I would not know if my eyes were closed listening to anyone on the panel, or if I didn't know better, looking at all the beautiful work, I wouldn't distinguish it. I wouldn't put a label on it. And I think sometimes we do ourselves this favor to want to be in that label. When I go into a place, I don't say, I'm Iris, um, I'm black. I don't, I don't have to say that. It's not important. We know it should be about our character and our skill. But each one of these pieces and each one of you is obviously have some dynamic voices and inside it makes you bring this out because if I didn't know, I wouldn't know. It's just that beautiful. Thank you for the invitation. How's that? I have to say something I've been planning since you started talking to talk about what I would say about your voices because that's my art and I've always wanted to have your art you know like straight hair likes curly etc cetera, etc cetera. so I don't need the microphone obviously okay. thank God because it's not a great microphone okay. but I, I'm enamored with all of you because this is what I've always wished I could do and I would encourage you to branch out from this and tell who you are by the sound of your unique voices. Each, there are no two voices in the world the same. Exactly. And the expression you gave here is your uniqueness. 
And when you talk about that to educate people who are ignorant, and we're all ignorant about certain things, especially this topic tonight, many people are, I've always said labels don't define, they confine. Yes. And so you've each pointed that out without saying that, that's what you want. Yes. But you want to educate, and the way to educate, look at me preaching, I'm a teacher, okay? Yes. <laughs> but you, you have to speak with your truth, which is first your true voice. And you, none of you tonight, tonight spoke with that true voice. A couple of you outdid the others because I couldn't understand most of the things you were saying. Complicated, I'm assuming, because what you do is very inward. And when I sing, it's inward, but I learned to use the voice to project. So I would encourage you to express everything that you feel and can put brilliantly in these colors to bring color to your voices. And the next time, and there should be a next time, that all of you do this again, that you speak with confidence yes. and authority yes. and show people who you really are yes. by the sound of your voices. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you all very much. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I turned you into a question about. Uh, I get to it.
And I actually felt the opposite. I felt like people were really open and vulnerable. Uh, people did really speak very open and vulnerable, as, as opposed to, you know, that you didn't have your own voice. Um, as you were talking, I was, I was reminded of something I read recently of one of my favorite artists in the world, Nina Simone. And she, I didn't know that her name was not Nina Simone. She grew up in a very Christian household, and her name originally was something I don't remember it now, but someone asked her why did she change her name, and she said, well, my family is you know, very, very Christian, and I don't want them to hear the devil's music. Right. And the <laughs> irony of it, she became so yes. famous. I'd love to know what her family thought of her afterwards. But I don't know what I did. Um, that said, I was just wondering, and this is a very personal question, and feel free not to answer if you don't want to, but, um, do you ever find when you do your work um, thinking about the people in your lives um, that have hurt you or have negated who you are as a person? I know it's empty. Does that influence in any way? Either you know, you know, I'll do whatever I want and and, and, and a response to you know like a protest art or in a way conforming or in a way hide, hiding. I, I don't know. In any form, do they ever? Your community, your people, your family, did it ever come on your mind as you were doing your work? Can I, can I answer that question? That's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, so, for every great story, there's a protagonist and an antagonist. For me, the antagonist is uh, culture itself. Um, so, for me, that's why collaging is really sort of like, um, it sets the narrative for my work specifically. Um, and so a lot of the symbols and stuff that's there both informs, it also shows the tension that could be inside that person's consciousness or their mind. Uh, so um, I believe the sort of enemy is that, um, but it also is a part of this, the, the connection of, of how it's informing to the viewer what's exactly going on in the, in the portrait that you see. Um, I don't know for each of you all how that works um, in terms of talking about someone that's hurt you or whatnot, but I know for me that's my way, my way of doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so. I, so my art, I like to describe my art as a visual diary. Um, I actually published uh, a book of illustrations that's called a visual diary, and it really, um, it shows a three year period of my life during the pandemic. I was really struggling with um, friendships, and so to your point, um, kind of trying to understand those friendships and their place in my life. Um, I was struggling with, you know, um, really having a conversation about my sexuality with my father. As I said before, I'm Nigerian American, and you know, culturally, as a Nigerian American um, or a Ni Nigerian, like really to honor your parent, to honor your family, is to kind of respect and honor your parents, and to kind of live a life that you know they want, and so. It's uh, a joke around with a lot of Nigerians um, that you know you're either supposed to be a doctor, a lawyer, <laughs> or engineer, and so if you're not those, then you're you know you're not living um, right. Um, and so I didn't follow that path that he wanted for me. And um, it was yeah, I tried to though, and. Um, Coming out to him as a gay man was hard because it's like, not only I'm not a doctor, but I'm also gay. And I'm also <laughs> gonna have kids. And so like, kind of, I kind of explore those things in my art and, you know, disappointing people and not really, you know, living my life, but kind of trying to live the truth for other people. And so um, those are definitely things that I explore in my art um, and in my writing. You know, I've heard you say that before, Ricardo, about the iconography in your work, but honestly, every time I enter your work, I, I do see that, 
but I also feel this sense of nostalgia and get this, you know, kind of transport back into the nostalgia of each little piece if I recognize it from my own childhood. So I find that so interesting what you just said. Hi, uh, my name is Seba. I want to thank all the artists on the panel and thank you for the fruitful discussion. I don't remember exactly what the question was before, but it was something about highlighting, the question before that was asking the panel was highlighting trans art, uh, non-binary art, and kind of elevating it to a point where it's almost isolated. And my question is, do we think that serves as a disadvantage in a way? Um, isn't all art art? To separate it is to put it in a box. Of course we want to highlight it, and of course we want to celebrate it. Um, but is there a way that we're doing it that might commercialize it too much, or might, I don't know, isolate it from the rest of the art? Like, this is art, but this is trans art, right? Um, and is that something that we consider when we're representing LGBTQ plus art forms, artists, and how we represent ourselves? Well, I could answer that as a curator, because I get that question all the time, but Artist, I don't know. I guess it's a question of where the label sits, you know. I mean, you can look at a lot of art from the, you know, kind of European medieval Renaissance canon and say, that's queer art, that's trans art, that's not labeled that way, we see it as part of the white Western European canon. I think we need labels, but you also need to go beyond labels. You kind of need a tension between the two. I think anyone who's going to take time with art will understand that on a certain level. Or no, maybe I have to think on that or disagree with you or whatever. Um, because the thing is, people use labels. Because what if I present it here to blank nothing? Will you relate to me? Will you? No. You need to know. You need to know, like, that is a part of me, but I'll also. You know, like in this exhibition, I didn't only present like queerness as in gender, but also like my ancestry and stuff like that. But like I said, like um, if it's like a blank thing, will people relate to that? Probably. Like um, how, there's actually a turn of people that like to plant and all that that are that like take everything away. No, like uh, as a good lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, minimalist. Like some people relate to that. Yeah, but like most people are not like that. Most people have a lot of history. Most people relate to these labels because that's what they've been taught since a young age. Because yeah, it's been used sometimes uh, um, to commercialize. But how would I commercialize? How would I reach to people if it's blank? Um, I think that, um, you know, you can stand on whatever line you want to, you know, especially as an artist. Um, you can take away identifiers and you can place them there, just like as we were discussing before, does your art always tell uh, a, specific, a specific narrative? Um, for me, sometimes my art does and sometimes my art doesn't. Sometimes I just want to see, sometimes I just want to be. And you can't tell me that it's wrong, you know? Like, very much, I wish you would tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if I made it, it's the shit. <laughs> I'll just say really quick that uh, if this show, if this show wasn't structured that way, we wouldn't have had this entire conversation and dialogue. True. And True. for some of us, uh, this is conversations that we have often. But clearly, from some of the feedback from the audience, this is conversations and stories that people don't normally hear. So 
I think it's a great question, and I think that we should think about that, and I think that there's uh, different spaces and times for that. And also, this show started in June for Pride Month, and so I think that's also a good time to celebrate and acknowledge these identities. But I think it's something we should interrogate. This was really inspirational, and I'm from somebody who's not part of your artist. In your individual capacities as artists, how do you resist commercialization and cynical exploitation of the kind of work that you do? Right? There's, there's a kind of, you know, there's a whole, I'm sure you you all know about this film, Wolf Capitalism, right? So I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out, so this is, a, this is an issue with um, artists and musicians everywhere, right? Of any kind, which is that there's this kind of a, well, this is the culture and this, it's profitable, so let's just do it. But then your integrity gets valued and erased. How do you individually try to deal with this? Can I ask a follow-up question really fast? How many of you are making a full-time living as artists? They wait till they die. It's worth it. It's worth a lot. I guess I can help. Very rich families that I I I tend to just conceptually stay with what the work wants. The work tells me what it wants. It's very, very clear on what it wants. So I take myself out of the equation. If something doesn't feel right, with say a situation or a particular request, I'll just politely decline it. Um, so I think that's how I, I deal with it. Um, to answer your question, I wish I could do this all day long. You know, but I think that, uh, especially being an American artist, we have to be very crafty in, in how to juggle a nine to five and our art hustle until the art hustle becomes our nine to five. So if you hear a lot of uh, story or artist stories from this country, it's almost identical to each other where they, we had to all have nine to fives until we didn't anymore. Um, but you, it, it's something about staying true to your platform and your story. So. Um, I think there's something that's inside of all of us that says that's not a good idea, don't do it. This is not the direction you need to go, whether it's with the work itself or it's with a particular, say, uh, art dealer or just said the other that your instinct is saying this is, this is not a good fit for you. You should work with this curator or this space, but not this curator in that space. So. I think uh, to answer all artists, all artists are truth tellers. And so when they are confronted with whatever their medium is, they are telling a truth. And when you're in the business of telling a truth, you're not thinking about whether that truth is gonna sell. Um, of course, you, you, you should make a living, you want to make a living, we should value art enough and value the truth tellers of society enough that we pay our artists because it, it is the one thing that that makes it possible to live with joy and truth in this world. But I don't know any real artist that approaches their medium and says, hmm, what's gonna sell? Is this gonna sell or is that gonna sell? That wouldn't be truthful. And almost every artist that I know is in the business of truth. So I think in the spirit of understanding that we're all individuals, we're all on our personal journey, um, I would love to hear more about, well, you're, you're all here today at this gallery, um, but I would love to know how you show up um, outside 
like here, um, and <coughs> with yourself, um, and share with the Kubernetes community. Um, just learn more about you all as individuals. So if someone would like to share. Okay, could you could you repeat the question again, just so that we all yeah. yeah. So um, how do you show up in your communities? How do you bring yourself and like put yourself out there? Like where where else can we find you? Like around like the neighborhood and stuff as well. You know. Um, Understanding that we're, we all have different ways of showing up in the community. It may not be through our art. It may be uh, through our engagement with um, other people, um, with our support, um, in volunteer hours, or what we do in work, or programs that we build. And yeah. How do you live out your values and, and show up your and bring your identity to the community? Um, I would I would say that um, you know I studied at SUNY Purchase and I did a lot of community-oriented uh, classes in Yonkers. And I grew up in northern Westchester, which is very, very different than Yonkers. Um, and I had to unlearn a lot of stuff about Yonkers. But since then, uh, I've been coming back to Yonkers. I love Yonkers. I love the community here. Um, and now um, I'm doing this project on this photographer who grew up in Yonkers, and then he died and retired in Maine, where my family's from. And specifically, I'm looking at his um, photo series from 1930s, 1937 about, um, where he photographed the waterfront here in Yonkers, in Ludlow. And um, there was a beach, sort of beach, that was there that people went to. And now it's been covered over by the sewer plant that's there from since the 60s. And now the city is, and county is building a huge park uh, right next to the sewer plant. And so my project that I've been working on is to uncover this history. And it all kind of started in having conversations with local people in Yonkers about different histories, because everyone has a different knowledge that they can contribute. And in the end, um, all the photos from this photographer were bought by a woman in Maine, and they all remain in a storage locker, pretty much. And so I've had to go and dig them out. And I've just found out that all of his writing was donated to someone. He, he left all his writing to someone in Maine. I tried to contact this person, didn't hear anything. And it turns out they have dementia and they're in a facility and uh, they have, they're on Medicaid. And so the state has all of their property. And now their cousin is trying to get all of that and donate it to a library in Maine. So all of that history is kind of locked away in different pockets. So I'm working with HAFA to put together a show here for next year where we can talk about his work, highlight him as a local artist, talk about the future of this park. I want to talk with the city and get um, their input, and I want to have it be something that the community can respond to. Because a lot of these photos are basically like lost in time. Wow. And I'm really excited to share them with people. And, um, and as Seth mentioned, our work overlaps a lot. Um, talking about the fishermen, there's many, many pictures that George took of the waterfront and fishermen and the scene that was happening in Yonkers. Um, so I'm really excited to share that with you all and um, hopefully you'll come back to see that show in the year. I actually know my favorite part is to get <laughs> to, get started, to be honest. <laughs> I think eating and drinking is a great way to get the mind open to uh, one, get to know other people. And then from that, great ideas come from that. Uh, so some of the best themes, opportunities, projects have come by having dinner with people. Um, and also I use Instagram, which has been a wonderful way to sell art, uh, which I never thought in a million years I'd sell anything on Instagram, but I've been able to do that quite a, quite a bit. So, uh, Bar Francis 9876, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and also just interactions like this, too. Um, I think exhibiting, for us artists, exhibiting is a great way to network with the community. 
you know, it's a great way to meet people and you never know what you meet. So. You never know. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> I show up as a, well, my, my dream job is a teaching educator. Um, so that's how I show up and get to combine art. So my day job, I work in supply diversity. I, I do not do art full time, <laughs> um, but it, yeah. Uh, but um, I really got into art mainly because of a really good friend who he came over to my apartment one day and um, looked at some of the illustrations that I created and said, "You are really talented. Why don't you show this?" and um, he took time and, you know, brought me to his studio and photographed all my pieces and helped me create a website. And, and so community was really important for me to get started um, showing my art. Um, and since then, I self-published a book of illustrations, a visual diary. Um, and I also wrote a memoir, a whole book. And so I've just really kind of been creating because it feels right. and. I have a lot to say and a lot to share and um, yeah, so I've showed up, I've kind of shown my work. We did a group show together, we band together and me and another friend, we you know, we rented a space and did a group art show. Um, we've done some book events and um, another one of my friends told me about this event. So I really just have been keyed into my community um, my friendships, and I just try to show where I can and say yes. Well, um, I'm a little confused about this question because uh, I'm the person who just try what I can, and I have a little time here. And when I came here, I was the first one I feel my friends just suggest me something for to do. And I say, yes, let's try. And a little before COVID, I started to do live stream. And I tried to share my process for my friends. I was in Brazil, in the beginning, I was, that was impossible to like talk in English with my friends here. And I keep doing this, I keep doing my live stream, and that's created the link for YouTube, created the link for Instagram, the link for TikTok. So I spend the most of the time with social media because that makes us really tired for doing that. But I keep doing this, and I think how they say the exhibitions we can create more connections, and my live stream helped me to know about the other artists doesn't matter digital or traditional, you can see sculptures or people creating music, live music or performance. And I just keep doing this because it's really good for me. I, I, I feel inspired for creating other things or sometimes we try or do something together because the time I think it's one hour of difference and sometimes we feel a little bit easier for this, but, and I just keep doing, I just, if I see something new or interesting or I can't do it just if I do it, just if I can, or sometimes many things cost zero, you just need to. So, and I just try. So, yeah, and um, I think at the beginning, I, you know, Simone, I know of her in White Plains and I just visited her studio and I think everything started there. Uh, I talked a little bit with her and she uh, gave me some advice and uh, I go back to pay because I stopped to pay maybe 10 or 15 years and I think she was my motivation mainly when I arrived here and I started to do everything because this kind of opportunity you can cannot find in my country. So many things it's impossible. So it's not about you to say, I want. Sometimes you have in your mind, I cannot. You wake up with this in my country, you cannot. So you never try it. And because this I also stop to pay, I also stop to do everything. But 
I think he hear my the first gift, the first the first gift from my friends was all this stuff about painting. He spots everything and say, no, you go back to painting because I know your talent. I say, okay, let's do. And I'm here, and I, I don't know when I will stop or where I will stop. So probably I, I don't want. And in here, you know, as yes, trust me. And many things is possible. We just need to. We just need to figure out or do that. When opportunities arise, I teach uh, collage workshops for kids and adults. Um, and in my photographer life, I'm working on a project. I was actually lucky enough to get a grant through the Bronx Council on the Arts. Um, and um, I worked on a project documenting senior citizens in the Bronx in all the neighborhoods um, through portraiture and then also interviews. And I actually really need to get cracking because it's due in December. <laughs> <laughs> of it all is very important because you know it's not very often where you see a black woman being an art teacher who also roller skates who is also showcasing work and I would be to uh, showcase you know what I'm saying so <laughs> you might be my next project <laughs> um, so I'm not sure which community that we're talking about we're showing up for um, I feel like, you know, we're truly intersectional, there's a gazillion communities. Um, but I've been loosely affiliated with the Yonkers Art community for almost 30 years. And I've gone in and out of it at various times. Um, you know, I spent 16 years working as a high school art teacher. I left that two years ago. And, um, you know, during that time, I wasn't really able to do a lot in terms of it. I kept making art, but I did not pursue opportunities to show it. Um, or when I sort of emerged from that cocoon, I started reaching out again, and I was so grateful that I had relationships with Ed or Barbara or, you know, um, people who I've known for a long time because you can build on those things. Um, and I just think, um, I feel like Westchester's gotten a lot stronger in terms of the institutional infrastructure for artists. I know that Yonkers certainly has. Um, and I think it's really grown as an art community. And I feel like I'm showing up for it, but it's showing up for me too, and that's great. Um, you know, there are other communities that I show up for. I've been very involved in a lot of anti-Trump activism in the last seven years. Kelly, me, I'm taking a break from it for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I could go on, but basically I would say that right now I feel like, you know, um, all of these spaces that are the spaces we have in Yonkers, in Westchester, in the Bronx, um, you know, are places that I feel like we should share. They're really good resources for me to relationships that 
Some of them are deep and some of them are new, but they're all things to build upon together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, always show up to my community and always show up as myself. But like, even if it's my quiet self, like, I show up um, because I feel like a lot of people always notice me, even if they don't tell me. And I feel like that's true. Um, because I noticed since I came living to the Bronx, um, a lot of kids come to me and ask me who you are, what are you, are you a man or a woman? And, and I just laugh, but I feel like it's also good for them because I'm showing up for them, like they're getting to see someone. And sometimes I'm also an art teacher as a, as a freelance. And it's also good for me to teach these kids with patience how to, how to, cut with a scissor, like last time I teach an 11 year old how to cut with the left hand, I, like I feel like no one had taught him how to do that in his life. And I got goosebumps with doing that. So um, yeah, I always show up as myself, quiet, patient, and creative.
Because Christine, no, I met I, Christine, the woman on the end, the woman on the end, I was walking along the river, she was taking a picture, and I asked to take a picture of her taking a picture, and, she, and then, that's the lady, and she texted me out of the blue and said, if you're around, by the way, this is going on. I didn't know about this until yesterday. I didn't know about this when I talked to you. Oh, 